Welcome to our video lecture on topic 11.2 movement, our essential understanding for the day. The rules of the musculoskeletal system are movement, support, and protection. Our objectives, we're going to outline function and structure of bone tissue. We're going to outline the anatomy of synovial joints. These are all the pieces and parts of those joints. We're going to outline the structure and function of muscle fibers, which are made up of myofibrils, which are made up of sarcomeres. One of the functions of these pieces and parts are muscle contraction. So we're going to talk about the sliding filament theory of muscle contraction. So first up, let's talk about some bone tissue. So bones and exoskeletons of insects provide anchorage for muscles and active levers. This is going to be our big topic of the day. These are not the only functions of bones, though. In us humans, they also provide some structure. We would be sad jelly-like blobs of skin and organs if it weren't for our bones giving us some shape. Bones also provide uh, protection for some of our tissues and organs. So the heart is behind the sternum because the job of the sternum is to help protect the heart. As I said earlier, this is our uh, topic du jour, acting as levers for body movement. Bones also have marrow that form bones, uh, the blood cells, sorry, marrow that forms blood cells, and then they also store minerals such as calcium and phosphorus. So some of the details regarding movement in muscles. So skeletal muscles are attached to bones by tendons, and then bones are attached to other bones by ligaments. We need to know the difference between tendons and ligaments. They're both cords of dense connective tissue that hold things together. Tendons connect bones to muscles. Ligaments connect bones to other bones. How I remember this, L comes before T in the alphabet, and B comes before M in the alphabet. Ooh, that was a weird M. So ligaments are bones to bones. Tendons are bones to muscles. Muscles can only do work by contracting. We need to have our muscles work in antagonistic pairs, working in opposite directions in order for us to get work done. Because if we could only move our joints in one direction, we would move them once and get stuck, and that would be the end. So here's an example of a joint with some antagonistic pairs of muscles. This is the elbow. We've got the biceps and we've got the triceps. When the biceps contract, the forearm gets pulled in. We're going to pull that radius and ulna up. We're going to bend that elbow. When the triceps contract, that forearm gets pulled back down. We're going to extend the arm. So we can contract, pull that forearm up, contract the triceps, and pull that forearm back out. These muscles are antagonistic pairs. They work in opposite directions so that we can both flex and extend our arm. So here's a close-up look at the elbow. These are actually um, pieces and parts that we need to have memorized. IB will sometimes ask us to label the humerus. Humerus is the long bone of the upper arm. Biceps and triceps, again, the biceps is going to contract and pull that forearm up. Triceps contracts and then extends that arm back out. In the forearm, we have two bones, the radius and the ulna. How I remember, ulna starts with U, and it's the bone that goes under the elbow. And then we have the radius is the other one. So the radius is not under the ulna with its letter U is under the elbow. We also have this amazing thing called the synovial joint in there, and we're gonna talk about that in quite a bit of detail in a couple more slides. Here's another example of a joint. Here's a bone, here's a bone. We've got the kneecap here. Here's a tendon that's connecting this muscle to this bone. It's a tendon, muscle to bone. We also have a ligament here. Remember that ligaments connect bone to more bone and it's connecting the kneecap, the patella, to the bone of the lower leg of the shin. Good, so just make sure that you're keeping in mind tendons and ligaments. And then of course, we've got these beautiful joints in there. Let's talk a little bit more detail about those joints. So our joints are where we are moving those um, connections between bones and muscles and tendons. Synovial joints are the ones that we're going to talk about the most. They have these cavities that are filled with fluid. We call it synovial fluid. And it just helps to prevent these bones from scraping against each other. So articulation is where bones come together. We don't really want bone scraping against bone. It's painful, it sounds bad and it hurts and it wears down the bone. So we've got a bunch of stuff in this joint to help to protect that articulation where those bones come together. 
Cartilage is tough and smooth tissue that reduces the friction where those bones are, are rub, that should say rub, not rib, sorry, <laughs> where they might rub against each other. Um, cartilage also acts as a little bit of a shock absorber, as does that synovial fluid. So the synovial fluid is some plasma, some water, some proteins, some glycoproteins, filling up this space, again, preventing these bones from rubbing against each other, um, also helping with some shock absorption if you're jumping or running, doing stuff that's causing these bones to get knocked around a little bit. The joint capsule is going to be around the whole entire joint. It is going to hold in the fluid and also prevent these bones from like dislocating, going out of joint. Our synovial joints allow for certain kinds of movements, but not others. And here is a close-up look at our synovial joints. So again, we've got bone and bone. There is this lovely capsule or membrane surrounding the whole thing that holds the synovial fluid inside the cavity. We also have some cartilage in here. So the cartilage, the fluid, the capsule, um, the capsule, the membrane all hold together these joints and allow for the bones to move without grating against each other too much. So we're going to flip from bones to muscles, talk a little bit more about muscles now. We actually have three different kinds of muscle tissue in our bodies. We have cardiac muscle cells in our hearts, um, super cool and branchy. This allows for myogenic contraction of the heart, remember that the heart contracts itself. We have some hormones, we have some nerves that can speed it up or slow it down, but the heart contracts itself, that's myogenic. We also have skeletal muscle, which we sometimes also call striated, and then we have smooth muscle, it is non-striated. This is what we're gonna focus on mostly today. It's got these super cool stripey things in it. Sometimes we refer to this as voluntary muscle. Um, I can choose to bend my arm, I can make it go. Smooth muscle is more in our digestive tract, peristalsis of the esophagus of the small intestine, large intestine it happens because of smooth or non-striated muscle. So lots of detail here about muscles and muscle cells. So we call the cells of the muscles, muscle fibers. So a fiber, a muscle fiber is a muscle cell. These cells are multinucleate. That means that they have extra um, nucleuses, right? They're one of our exceptions to cell theory. They are crazy, crazy, crazy long cells and they've got lots of nuclei, which is why we call them exceptions. They have some specialized endoplasmic reticulum. We call it the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum is the ER of the muscle cells. The cell membrane of the muscle cells we call the sarcolemma. So this sarc um, prefix we use quite a bit when we're talking about muscles. So the cell membrane is the sarcolemma. The cytoplasm is called the sarcoplasm. We have lots of glucose, lots of myoglobin because we definitely need so much ATP to keep these muscles um, contracting. Muscle fibers, these cells have lots and lots of myofibrils, like hundreds and thousands of them. Um, and then we have lots of mitochondria squeezed in between those myofibrils. So this is one chunk of a muscle cell. Here's that cell membrane, which we call the sarcolemma. Inside it, we've got lots of nuclei. So here's some of those nuclei. And then we have these crazy long tubes, these fibers that we call myofibrils. So lots and lots of myofibrils in the sarcoplasm and the cytoplasm. Um, and then we have lots and lots of, let me pick a better color so you can see, um, lots of mitochondria are stashed in between those myofibrils so that we can make all of that ATP to get um, these muscles doing all the work that they need to do. We have in that sarcoplasmic reticulum and the sarcoplasmic reticulum kind of weaves through all those myofibrils, lots and lots of calcium ions, and we'll talk about why that is important in a couple more slides. So we'll take another quick look at a muscle cell, a little uh, zoomed in here. So here's a muscle cell. Cell membrane, again, is the sarcolemma. We have lots of specialized endoplasmic reticulum between all these myofibrils. We call that the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The sarcoplasmic reticulum has lots and lots of calcium ions. We'll talk about the need for that calcium in a little bit. We have also plenty of nuclei 
floating around inside the sarcolemma. We also have some mitochondria embedded between those myofibrils. And then those myofibrils, we're talking about hundreds or thousands of them inside each of these cells. So this is one chunk of one cell, one muscle fiber. Inside a muscle fiber, a muscle cell, we have myofibrils. Um, this image is showing this part of the muscle cell. So here is some sarcoplasmic reticulum, some more sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then this, this little tubi guy right here, that's this tubi guy here. And then this tubi guy right there is this tubi guy right there. So each one of these is a myofibril filled with lots and lots of we're going to call them filaments for now, and I'll give you the words more later. Um, so endoplasmic reticulum that we call the sarcoplasmic reticulum, lots of calcium. We have all of these proteins in here inside each of these myofibrils. And so the whole big cell would be much, much bigger. Lots of glycogen floating around also inside the muscle because the glycogen is how we store glucose. We need lots of glucose in order to make ATP. We need ATP to get that muscle to contract. So we're going to zoom in on some myofibrils. So again, we've got our muscle cell, our muscle fiber. The muscle fiber is filled with myofibrils. I am going to take this little chunk of myofibril and we're going to zoom in on it. So this myofibril is here, myofibril. Um, lots and lots of these myofibrils in the muscle cells and the muscle fibers. The myofibrils are composed of a couple different kinds of filaments, a thick filament and a thin filament. The thick filament, these are all proteins, um, are made up of myosin, and then the thin filaments are actin. So these are proteins, myosin, and actin. I'm going to refer to each little piece of the myofibril as a sarcomere. Again, there's that prefix sarc talking about muscles. So a sarcomere is the functional unit of the muscle of the myofibril. This guy is going to contract as we've got a whole bunch of these. So there's sarcomere, 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 just this whole big line of sarcomeres. If all of them are contracting, then the whole myofibril is going to contract. And if all the myofibrils and all their sarcomeres are contracting, then the whole muscle contracts. So this is how, this is how we get the muscle to shorten, how we get it to, to contract. So pieces and parts of the sarcomere, these different kinds of filaments that are in the myofibrils. So we have the thick filament is myosin. It is this guy that's a little bit thicker. The thin filament is actin. It's this guy that's a little bit thinner. The actin is bound to these other proteins that are called the Z-disc. The um, thick filaments, the myosin, are attached also to the Z-disc by this super cool protein called Titan. Um, and, and so each of our sarcomeres is going to be myosin, actin, myosin, actin, myosin, actin, um, in these super cool layers. And we're going to talk a little bit more about myosin and actin now. So lots of details about actin and myosin. So actin, that thin filament, just about eight nanometers in diameter. We're looking at the actin here and here. We're also looking at it in this other image. It's the blue stuff here is the actin. Um, the myosin is that thick filament. It's here between those two actin filaments. It's a little bit thicker, 16 nanometers, twice as big as the actin. Um, it is this in, in the lower image, it's this thicker guy that is not so helical. So actin is helical. Myosin is more shaft-like. It's kind of solid. It's got these protruding heads. These heads are super cool. So myosin has these heads. In that upper image, these guys are the heads, the myosin heads. So myosin heads. Um, actin actually has places for those heads to stick, which is kind of cool. Actin is also associated with two other proteins, troponin and tropomyosin. Tropomyosin is this guy that kind of goes the length of the actin. The actin kind of wraps around the tropomyosin. Troponin is a little bit smaller. It's these little guys kind of chunked in here. So here's the troponin. Troponin on the tropomyosin, and then the actin also wraps around the tropomyosin. Myosin is here, myosin has heads. Good, all right. 
So again, here are our sarcomeres. Sarcomeres make up the myofibrils. Myofibrils make up those muscle cells. We call them muscle fibers. So, so muscle fiber, and then we have myofibrils, and then our myofibrils are made up of sarcomeres. So I'm focusing on one of those tiny little pieces. So this is one sarcomere. So sarcomeres, again, we've got actin, we've got myosin, myosin heads. The actin is associated with troponin and tropomyosin. I'm going to call the very middle, the very middle of my um, sarcomere is called the M-line just remember M for middle, right? We also have these Z discs. These Z discs are the ends of the sarcomere. So between every sarcomere, we have Z discs. In the middle of every sarcomere, we have an M line. What happens is these heads of the myosin bind to the actin and then push the actin in closer to each other. So these heads grab on and push in, these heads grab on and push in, and that causes the whole sarcomere to be contracted. So you can see, if I erase some of my scribbles, you can see how we have a lot of space in this H zone here when the sarcomere is relaxed, and then in contracted, there's very little space here in the middle. So how this even happens, how this happens, we refer to as a sliding filament theory. So we're talking about those filaments, the actin filaments, the myosin filaments sliding against each other. How this happens, um, we have lots of ATP involved, of course. So ATP hydrolysis, remember that hydrolysis is that breaking down of stuff. It's one of our catabolic reactions. We turn that ATP into ADP, an inorganic phosphate. Cross bridge formation, this is when the myosin heads the heads on the myosin bind to the actin. So that's that cross bridge formation when the heads of the myosin stick to the actin and that allows those filaments to slide against each other. This all happens because calcium ions make it go. So lots and lots of little details here. So pause the video, read, 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 and then I'm gonna talk about all these words on the next slide. So again, pause, read, Hopefully you are ready to talk. So this myosin cross bridge is going to attach to the actin. So here's our myosin, here's our myosin head. That myosin head is going to bind to the um, actin here. This happens when calcium, calcium is released, calcium binds to the troponin. That troponin then makes the tropomyosin, there's our tropo, myosin. Here's our troponin. So calcium binds to the troponin. Troponin causes the tropomyosin to move and that opens up those myosin binding sites on the actin. When those myosin binding sites are opened up, that myosin head can hold on to the actin. The ATP is going to pop off of the head and that allows the head to go in this direction, which is going to slide that whole actin filament that way toward the middle of the sarcomere, toward the M line. Then ATP is going to come along and it's going to stick to the head. So we're going to take ATP and it's going to stick to that myosin head. When the ATP binds to the myosin head, the myosin head is going to be released from the actin, from the myosin binding site on the actin. So we used to have head stuck to actin. The ATP actually pulls the head off of the actin. That ATP is then hydrolyzed. Again, we're going to break that ATP down into ADP and inorganic phosphate. When that happens, notice here, I've got the, the head is kind of bent that way. When we hydrolyze the ATP, the energy released allows the myosin head to kind of push backward a little bit. And then it's going to jump onto one of those myosin binding sites on the actin. And then we're going to let that AT, ADP and inorganic phosphate pop off. And that's going to pull that myosin head in toward the M line. We're going to slide the actin toward the M line. And then ATP will come in again. The ATP will knock the myosin head off the actin. ATP will be hydrolyzed into ADP and inorganic phosphate. That will pull that head up. It's going to stick to the 
myosin binding sites, ATP and inorganic phosphate pop off that allows the head to go back toward the M line and it just keeps going and going and going around and around and around. All right, so here are all those words again. If you need to pause the video and read again, definitely do it. Otherwise, let's see if we can predict if these pictures are muscles contracted or muscles relaxed. So here, uh, this guy versus this guy. I've got a sarcomere, right? So my sarcomere is here from Z line to Z line is one sarcomere. I've got my M line in the middle, Z line, Z line. Myosin thick filaments, actin thin filaments. Notice how wide open the M line is. We've got lots of mm, blank space in there. So this is going to be sarcomere relaxed. Notice how close the actin is here. It's even overlapping. This is sarcomere contracted because we had these myosin heads bind to the actin filaments and then pull them in toward the M line. How about these pictures? So here I've got M line, Z disc, Z disc, M line, Z disc, Z disc. One of these is contracted, one of these is relaxed. What do we think? Hopefully you're like, this is definitely relaxed. Look how big and paler this M line region is. Whereas here I've got so much actin and myosin overlapping, it's quite a bit darker in color. This one's a little bit harder because I haven't given you comparisons. You just have one chunk of uh, muscle tissue. And if you can read the uh, image credit down here, you can probably see, yes, this is contracted. Here's our M line, here's our um, Z disc. Notice how tight things are in on those M lines. Um, this is definitely contracted. These guys, my friends, all kinds of uh, mitochondria floating around in there. These little dollops, all those little dots are glycogen um, crystals, lots of glycogen stored in there. And we did it. We achieved all of our objectives. We outlined the function and structure of bone tissue. We talked about the anatomy of synovial joints. We know that tendons connect muscles to bones, ligaments connect bones to other bones. We know that there's cartilage and joint capsules, synovial fluid in the joint capsules to help prevent too much scraping of bone against bones. We outline the structure and function of muscle fibers. Fibers are made up of myofibrils. Myofibrils are made up of sarcomeres. Sarcomeres are made up of thick filaments of myosin and then thin filaments of actin. The myosin has heads. The actin has troponin and tropomyosin. Good. Um, we and then talked about the slide and filament theory of muscle contraction, where we've got those myosin heads are going to bind to the actin and then slide that actin in toward the M line of the sarcomere. And this is how muscles contract. Good work today.